Good to see you guys today. Amen? Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn with me to John 13. I challenged you last week. I hope some of you did go home. I'm not going to ask you who did. And read John 13 last week, one of the most, just a powerful passage of Scripture. As we wrap up our series on the Beatitudes and this part, this last section lived out for all to see, we uh, have been talking about the Beatitudes now for several weeks, and as we sort of think about today, if you, if you get John 13, I want you to take and put your finger there. We're going to back up also to Luke chapter 9. We'll start in Luke 9 today, so we're going to be in a couple of places to sort of set the stage for our time this morning, so don't miss out if we possibly can. I had an opportunity today. My wife had bought me a, a, a dad joke button some time ago. You know, you pop in, it tells these corny jokes. Well, this morning I laid my Bible down on my desk and Bob had bumped the dad joke button and this is what it said to me this morning. Why don't crabs share well? And the answer is because they're shellfish. <laughs> That'll help set the stage for our time this morning, if you would please. We've been talking about the Beatitudes, and if you were to go back and do a little historical understanding of where we've been and historically, we, we typically look at the ministry of Jesus in three parts. The first year to year and a half of Jesus' ministry after his baptism actually becomes what we would call the, the year of preparation. There was a lot taking place. There were several miracles that took place, uh, but uh, it was sort of the year of preparation. Most of what we have in the Gospels are not in that year. Most of it's in year two, and really most of, more of it's in year three. But we do move into the second year, and when we come to Luke chapter 9, what we're going to step into is really the beginning of about that second year. So think about timing-wise. So we, the disciples have been with Jesus now for about a year, year and a half, and they're, they're in a time where that they've, they've learned a lot, they've spent some time with him, they understand his, his life, and they've, they've begun to see things. Matter of fact, the year of preparation, matter of fact, year number two is going to be the year of popularity. We would find that many of that, much of that time is going to, that's where the Sermon on the Mount comes on. You know, he called, called the crowds together, feeding the 5,000, where it's all in that time period where there seems to be crowds and crowds and crowds of people begin to follow him. And it was in that second year that Luke chapter 9 comes to pass. And so, matter of fact, it's in the feeding of the 5,000 contextually, if you were to back up and look at the beginning of that. But at the end of Luke chapter 9, or at least halfway through Luke chapter 9, Jesus begins to tell his disciples that if you're going to choose to follow me, it's going to cost you something. You can't do it and live your life the way you want to do it. It's going to cost you something. As a matter of fact, that's what the Beatitudes is all about. When he began the second year and he start, talked to the Beatitude. We remember the Beat, first Beatitudes, blessed are the what? Poor and for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The reality is, is God says we've got to empty ourselves of us. We can't be a disciple of Christ and live for me. Uh, that, that's, that, that, that seems counterintuitive, but the reality is that's exactly what he's called us to do as God's children. If we're going to be a follower of him, we're going to have to empty ourselves of us. We're going to have to learn not only to, to find our understanding of emptying, but we're also going to have to learn something about the focus of our life. And the focus of our life is those who hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness. And not only does this tell us how that we're going to become a disciple, the first uh, three disciples, the first three beatitudes, and the fourth beatitudes being be the hunger and thirst for righteousness, the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth beatitude tells us what happens once we become a follower. And it ends with verse 12, blessed are those who are persecuted. And oh my goodness, we want to avoid that. But the reality is if we're going to follow Christ, if we're going to be a follower of Christ, if we're really going to be a genuine disciple, we're going to have opposition. So Jesus revisits this some months later after the Beatitudes with his disciples and said, hey, 
It's going to cost you something. Verse 23, Luke 9, 23, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself and take him his cross and follow me. There's going to have to be some things in your life that you let go of. There's going to be some things in your life that die to you. And then he walks out of that, out of this, out of this statement with his disciples, pulls his disciples with him. Eight days later, he, he takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, verse 28, up on the Mount of Transfiguration and miraculously is transformed before them. And they're sitting there. They're, the three guys are there. I've never been anywhere like this. This is so awesome. Let's build tents and just stay here. Wasn't that, that wasn't the intention of that, but they needed to be able to get a glimpse of what eternity was going to be like. And so God gave them an opportunity. And it's amazing when you get out of that, it would be only after this eight, what's it going to cost to be a disciple? Eight days later, we're going to get into the Mount of Transfiguration. And two days after this mountaintop experience, they jump into a time when the disciples are in conflict. We jump down to Luke 9, 46. An argument rose among them as to which of them... Does anybody remember the Smothers Brothers? Most of us are too young for that. I do understand that, but I remember the Smothers Brothers. Mom always liked you best, right? Well, that's what they're asking. They want to know the question. Who's, who's, who's his favorite? I think he likes me more. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? What, what positions are we going to have when we get to the other side? You know, I think I'm going to have a little better position than you are. And, you know, that's the story. There's conflict among them. And I, I imagine when Jesus is looking, and we've been, we've been with each other now for a couple of years, and the only thing you can actually get out of this whole journey as a follower of Christ is who's going to be the greatest? Let me ask you a question. When you get onto an elevator and the doors open and you push floor two or three or 22 or whatever number it is, and the doors don't immediately close, have you ever asked yourself why it is that you push the close button? It's because you want it to move faster. Let me just make it a little bit more practical. If, when you and I find ourselves on the great interstate parking lot of Interstate 4, and when you're in one of those moments that you could actually walk faster than you're driving, have you ever asked yourself why it is that you are frustrated at the slowness of traffic? It's because you want to get somewhere quicker than you're getting. And the question could be to ask about a waiting in a doctor's office or whatever other particular piece that we might be visiting in when we find ourselves. The truth of the matter is, we oftentimes want things in life that we're not getting. And the reality is, when we find ourselves in those moments and the, fr the lives in the around us are frustrating or whatever it is, at who is the center of our frustration? Is it not me? I, I am. I'm the center of my frustration. It's not, not, it does have nothing to do with the traffic. It has nothing to do with the, the long wait in the doctor's office. I want to do something different than what we're doing, right? Can we be honest? And when the disciples got to the place a couple of years into this journey with Christ... And the only thing they can figure out is, I want the number one seat. You'll have to get the number two seat. I would love to say that when this story comes to this place that you and I would say, whew, they finally got it figured out. Jesus corrected them and they got everything figured out. But I'd like to draw your attention another year at least forward. As a matter of fact, we're one day day prior to the crucifixion as a matter of fact when you get to that setting of time and if you have your bibles with you hold hold luke 22 we're going back there but would you join with me back to john 13 which is where we're going to spend our time together today we're one day before the crucifixion 
Jesus has now gathered his disciples now. They've been together three and a half years. They've been through a lot of difficulties. As a matter of fact, year one may have been the year of preparation. Year two may have been the year of popularity. Year three was the year of persecution. They had been through a lot. There had been, there'd been some folks walked away because they've been through a lot. John 6, 66, remember that? Many chose that day to walk no longer with him because it was just too tough. But his disciples have gathered into the upper room. It's Jesus and how many people? Twelve, just a hint. <laughs> I know some of you, I, wait a minute. Yeah, I know you're counting, I know, but it's just twelve. Let's just go with twelve. And they're in the upper room. Jesus, or this John captures the moment. Now listen to what he said in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the what? End. And then verse 2. I want you to catch, don't, don't miss this, during supper. Can Baptists say amen? All right, good deal. Glad we're there. They had come to the Lord's Supper, what we commonly talk, call the upper room experience. They had got to the place Jesus has pulled his disciples. They've back, we're going back to Luke 22, so if, you, if, you, if you'll just go ahead and scoot there. They pulled his disciples together, and they're in the upper room. They're getting ready to have the Lord's Supper, and what we would know, now know it would be constituted in Luke chapter 22, formalizes that. It's one of the passages of Scripture we use to sort of help us to walk through that passage to understand what the significance was and how Jesus uh, had laid it out for us. And matter of fact, that's exactly why what we find in Luke many times. While Mark oftentimes is so very much concerned about the chronological order, Matthew hit and misses it, but he's really concerned about making sure that the Jewish thing stands out. Luke gives us a lot of detail that a lot of other guys just leave out. So in Luke 22, he's telling us the same story in Luke 22 that John's telling us in John 13. It's the same event, the same moment. And so the institution of the Lord's Supper here in, in Luke 22, verse 14, and the hour would come to, he reclined at the table and his apostles with him, and he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat the Passover with you. Again, we've got the Lord's Supper taking place. He's getting ready to give us instruction. If you notice the next probably point in your Bibles that has something to do with a sub-point, it goes to verse 24. So after the instruction of the Lord's Supper, I can almost imagine this holy moment. We've gathered together. We know something significant is taking place. And we've had the Lord's Supper. And what's the first words out of the disciples' mouth? A dispute arose among them as to which of them was regarded as the... Are you kidding me? Three and a half years with Jesus. They're one day before the crucifixion. And what are they still most concerned about? What rank am I? Who's their focus? Themselves, right? You can see that in the text, can't you? They're most concerned about themselves. And then he gives them this story. <laughs> And then he goes on to tell us about Peter. By the way, if you jump on down to verse, 20, verse 31 of this passage, he's going to give us some specific instruction about Peter. Peter's in the group. I imagine Peter's one of the guys going, ha, ha, he likes me best. Remember back in Luke, and I should have gotten this back in Luke chapter 9 because Luke chapter 9 gives to us another, another significant piece in that story, but I didn't. We'll, you can go back there later. But in Luke chapter 9, there was also a setting in that context where that Jesus had his disciples to, you know who I am? Who does the people say that I am? And remember what Peter says, thou art the what? Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus renamed the guy named Simon, he renamed him to Peter. Because upon this rock, you're going to be an instrumental part of this. Upon this rock, I'm going to build, the church, build this church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it, according to Matthew 16. 
So this, con- this conflict has now arisen among the disciples, this dispute as to which one's going to be the greatest. In verse 31 of your Bibles, look there carefully. Don't, don't, don't miss this. Don't miss this. Peter, Peter. Is that what it says? No. He calls him by his given name. He doesn't call him by the name that he had been renamed. He called him Simon. I think contextually it's the same thing that your mother did when she needed to get your attention. My mom called me Mark David when she was serious about the matter. And Jesus is calling Peter because it's a serious moment. We've got this Lord's Supper taking place the night before the crucifixion. The time has come, and you guys are most concerned about who's number one in rank. And I, but, oh, I imagine that's one of those moments that if Jesus was God, and he was, (laughs) he wanted to take them out and start a whole new bunch. You think he's ever been that way with you? (laughs) I know he has been with me. Simon, Simon, listen, he said, verse 31. Satan has demanded the right to test each one of you as a farmer does when he separates wheat from the husk. But Simon, I've prayed that your faith will be strong. And notice this next statement. I'm reading from the ESV, and it may be a little different. uh, terminology here but I want to make sure you don't miss this as verse 32 ends and when you have come back to me Jesus not only knew that he was going to deny him before the sun rose the next morning Jesus also knew there was going to be a restoration When you've come back to me, help the others. Peter said, whoa, Jesus, you've got to be kidding. I'm not only number one in rank, but I'm willing to go with you no matter the cost. Remember, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to have to take up my cross, take up your cross and follow me daily. Lord, I don't care the cost. If I go to jail or even if I die, I will never, ever, ever depart from you. Jesus replied, Peter, again, interestingly enough, he changes his name back to his allotted name. I tell you that before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you'll say three times that you don't even know me. Now, I said all that, and I know that's a pretty sizable introduction, but I said all that because if we read John 13 without that background, you'll miss the significance of why John 13 is so critical. Remember, Luke 22, the Lord's Supper, is the same event that John 13. John 13 only gives us partial, partial information. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of information that John gives us. Matter of, as, as Jesus is getting ready to do this, this really uh, hum, hum, humbling act before them, Luke doesn't record that, but John does. And so when you pull these two pieces together, you understand something of the context of what's taking place at this moment. And at this moment, what we're getting ready to see, Jesus is going to address the the, the moment. He's going to address the event of the day. He's going to address the real issue in the room. And the real issue in the room is that you've walked with me now for three and a half years and you have not yet come to be a real disciple of mine. Because if you're going to follow me, you're going to take up your what? And deny who? Hmm. So we walk into this journey, and for the next few moments, I'm just going to take and try to walk out a quick outline if I can. I know there's quite a few fill in the blanks, but I think we'll move fairly quickly today. But I think we need to understand the context before we understand 
what's taking place. John 13, 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, he knew the timing was at hand for him to depart out of this world and go to the Father. He have, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During the supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come back from God and was going back to God, and if we can, pause there because we first need to understand that what Jesus is doing is setting a table before his disciples. He's setting a table. He's giving us an understanding of what took place. Now, again, we have to sort of grasp the idea of what took place in Matthew, Luke 22 to be able to understand something of the why but I want to make sure we don't miss this. As Jesus sets the table before his disciples, we need to first understand that there's a setting at hand. That's letter A in your notes, the setting. And the setting is that it's come time. The time has come. He spent three and a half years with his disciples. And the, that while that three and a half years was important, the reality was everything that Jesus has done in his life prior to then was really for the purpose of this moment. And Jesus is getting ready to, to be the sacrifice. He's going to be, be the sin bearer, not only for the 12 that's in the room that day, but also for every one of us. The setting has been set. It's his hour to depart is there. We also see the agenda, letter B in your notes. His motivation, that what drove him to this point, and, we, the, the, and the agenda was he, he loved his own. Jesus knew that when he, he should depart of this world, having loved his own which are in the world, he loved them all the way to when? The end. It's interestingly enough that the word depart, I put this in your notes, is only used here in, in connection. It speaks to a transfer of one sphere to another. In other words, death was not going to interrupt his being. Why? Because Jesus existed in creation. He was the son of the living God in creation. He existed today in, in person as the son of God to be the sacrifice for our sins. And he will exist in eternity. Why? Because he's God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He may be departing the moment, but death was not going to interrupt his being. It's only going to change his mode. But the motivation of why he came to begin with and why he was here and why, let me say this pretty bluntly, why he put up with his disciples for three and a half years. And can I say, may, may, may I make it just a little bit more personal? Why he puts up with you and me. Is because he loves us to the end. So we see his agenda. We see letter C in your notes, there's, a, there's an oddity at place. <laughs> in this story of his disciples and all that's taking place in this, what we would see this sacred moment of time, we're introduced to a guy that's here. All of a sudden, the guy that shouldn't be here. <laughs> and his name is Judas who had already made a pact with a priest in Matthew chapter 26, Isaiah, looking forward prophetically, says that this pact was an agreement with hell itself. And yet as Jesus gathered his disciples that day to do that which he was going to do for his disciples that day, he did for his disciples even the one who had already chosen to betray him. Jesus knowing the hearts of every one of them. You know, we want to point out this morning, and here's, what, here's what's so guilty of us. We want to point out the fact that that rascal Judas. But I don't want you to miss Luke 22. Because there is not one of his disciples that's not without fault here. The rest of them are complaining and arguing, fighting over who is number. And it's in the context of this moment that the motivation of Jesus brings him to this place to pull these people around him that are quasi in name only disciples. 
I'm not saying they weren't saved. But there's not one of them yet sold out. And he gives us a little insight into letter D in your notes, the things that are to come, the future. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and now was going back to God. Not one of his disciples were prepared to render any service to their master, let, us, let alone each other. Here's one other um, one other matter that probably we need to talk about. They've been at the table long enough to have eaten the main course. They're getting ready to take probably the most sacred part of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper contextually was a part of a meal. So they'd eaten the main course, and there's probably a small break here before Jesus is actually going to do the Lord's Supper himself or help them to be able to get there. And there needs to be this matter that we address, but in this moment that seems to be the most sacred and most holy moment in the process of time, the table had been set, the disciples had come in, they had sat around the table, they had eaten the main course of the meal, and not one of them had bothered to figure and go back and do the thing that needed to be done when any Jewish family invited another Jewish family into their home. Nobody had washed the feet of the people who came in. So it was a tradition. It was a norm. Nobody took the role of a servant. And they'd taken an opportunity to sit around the table that night and to eat. How many of you all have ever eaten without washing hands? Don't raise your hands. Sometimes we just don't do the things. We, you know, we just, we're in a hurry or whatever it is. I don't know what happened that evening. Maybe they were so concerned about who's number one that they just missed it. But somewhere along the line, that what, what was obvious this evening was that no one was willing to take the role of a servant for the rest of them. But Jesus would be. Writing your notes somewhere, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and following. G Peter, Paul said it this way, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robber to be equal with God, but took upon himself the form of a what? Servant, and humbled himself and became obedient to the cross, that he would become our sin bearer. But not only did he humble himself become obedient to the cross, we find the display of that in this text radically well watch for the balance of our time together verses 4 through 17 there's only a second point we see the towel of humility we find for his disciples it's not a fill in the blank there I don't think the towel and he does that he, he, the towel aspect has to do with while he set the table he's given us an understanding of the context of what's taking place there needs to be a display of something that he that he's that he's looking for his disciples to embrace and not only to embrace to be able to hold on to but to display in their own life and so he gives them verses 4 through 11 a model for the next generation Jesus is no longer concerned about the disciples in the room alone. Jesus is setting the stage for what the disciples must be doing for the rest of the world so that the generations, plural, that are to come would grasp and embrace and understand what Jesus had done on their behalf. Understanding and knowing our awkwardness. To some level, we are all crabs. Going back to my dad joke, the reason why crabs don't share well is because they are shellfish. To some level, we're all crabs. And Jesus has to address the issue of our crabbiness. <laughs> Don't go home and say to your spouse, the pastor said you were crabby. Don't you do that. Don't you. Jean, if you do that to Pat, she'll know that she, she might say that to you, but you don't say that to her. But there's a model that needs to be done. Jesus takes an opportunity to be able to give us an example 
before he gives us an exhortation. He takes an opportunity to display what we need to do, to do what we need to do, in order before he gives it to them a direction of what they need to be doing in their life. That first the deed, then the discourse, first word, first, first deeds, and then words later. So we find in verses 4 and 5 a new paradigm. A new paradigm. That's your fill in the blank, your little letter I. Notice what Jesus did. He rose from the supper, he laid aside his outer garments, and he take, took a towel, tied it around his waist, then he poured out water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. Nobody else had done that previously. And he took the towel that was wrapped around him and began to do this. There was a sense of deliberateness about the Lord's action. The outer garment, which was only ever taken off by a male, would ever, would, only when he was at work or at nighttime, many times the outer garment would be taken off as a, as a covering, uh, as a, as a uh, cover while he was sleeping. But now he takes upon this outer garment and he places around him a towel, a, a sign, a symbol of, of servanthood, of humility, took a basin, filled it with water, and approached the first one of his disciples. Now, as I'm thinking about this moment, Jesus being, we already know that he is king of kings and lord of lords. The disciples have already acknowledged that he's, he's the son of the living God. They've gathered that to some level. We're going to see even more of that. But the leader of the house does the most menial task. And I imagine, especially in light of their most recent conversation. What was their most recent conversation? Do not, do not forget it. Who's the greatest? I can imagine in light of their most recent conversation that there must have been a hush in the room. One of those moments where they found themselves sort of overwhelmed with guilt, with possible discouragement, with a sense of understanding the significance of the moment that they had not taken anything previously, but Jesus now is giving them a new paradigm. As the incarnate Son of God moves from disciple to disciple and finally to the feet of Judas himself and washing Judas' feet, what a day that must have been. Verses 6 through 9 gives to us an impulsive reaction. There has to be one in every crowd. And his name was Peter. When he came to Simon Peter, I imagine Simon was probably close to the end. But anyway, when he came to Simon Peter, Peter's question was, Lord, <laughs> you think you're going to wash my feet? And Jesus said to him, Peter, what I'm doing, you don't understand now, but afterwards you will. Obviously, there's a deeper lesson here than simply mere foot washing. It's not just the ritual that's going to be bringing about. There's a significance that's spiritual that's much deeper. So Peter said to him, as most people would, well, then don't wash my feet. Why don't you just wash my whole body? <laughs> Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you'll have no share with me. So Peter said, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. It was a repulse. There was an impulsive reaction. There's an exhibition that Jesus instructs. As a, there's a telling exposition as it would be in verses 10 and 11. First of all, he speaks to the 12, all disciples. Verse 10, he says, Jesus said, to them, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. In other words, they're at Calvary. They had not seen it yet. They didn't understand what was happening. They didn't know, but what we do know is Jesus climbed upon Calvary's cross, shed his life's blood in order that the sins of all who would come to him and trust him would be washed away. There's a radical cleansing that takes place when you and I place our faith in Jesus Christ. Every sin that you have committed, every sin you are committing, every sin you will ever commit has all been taken care of in that one moment. You have been radically cleansed and nothing can ever separate you from the, from the love of God. And that's, that's, a, that's an amazing feat. However, the disciples 
needed their feet washed. Why? Because there needs to be a a recurrent cleansing in every one of our lives. How many of you all sinned this week? The rest of you just did. Lying is still a sin. I know that. It's getting old. I understand that. But it still is. And as we find ourselves walking in this journey of life, we continue to blow it. We continue to walk out faith, and sometimes we don't walk out faith very well. Sometimes we're a lot like Peter, and we find ourselves sort of all over the place. But the reality is his message to the 12 is, is the, the cleansing of the Calvary is going to take care of every one of your sins, but you need to be cleaned every day. You need to come back so that the fellowship that you enjoy with Jesus Christ can be restored. Your salvation's never broken, but the fellowship is. But there's also a word to the traitor, last part of verse 10, and you are clean, but not every one of you. And then he spoke specifically about what he had previously concealed. For he knew who he was to portray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. I've got a hunch at this moment in life, there's no way biblically to prove this, but I've got a hunch with this story and the way this is laying out, that as, as Judas, while he had already made a pact with the, with the uh, centurions to come and capture and arrest Jesus, I've got a, I, I, I sense just the way the wording of this passage says this was Jesus with his final olive branch to Judas to say, if no matter what, you've, what choices you've made, the opportunity is still available for you to come to faith in Jesus Christ. I say that because it's encouraging to every one of us because some of us have blown it miserably. Anybody blown it miserably? I, I'm going to say I have. Sometimes we need to be reminded that no, no matter how far we've gone away from God, God still has an opportunity for us to come back until, as long as life is still within us. Secondly, we find, or let her be in your notes, there's an exhortation, the teaching. He's already given them the example, now he's going to give them an exhortation, a teaching. A, 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 some, some, uh, he demonstrated humility, now he's going to declare what needs to take place as a result of what he's done. And what we need to grasp, what we need to understand is the key. We talked about this title of this message is the, is the key to the discipleship, the key to the successful discipleship. And it's wrapped up here in verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on their out, his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? Well, obviously, we know physically what you've done. We understand to some level that. But as you step in the room and see the tension and feel the tension that's going on, and I imagine here no one's willing to speak, I almost sense a similar feeling as what it must have been in John chapter 8. Remember the lady caught in adultery? Crowds were around. Everybody's making accusations and yeah, stoner, stoner, stoner. And Jesus knelt down. And what did he do? He began to ride in the sand. Not a word was spoken. He just wrote. There has to be a bunch of tension. Nobody else is speaking either. And he looks up and says, "You who are without sin, cast the first stone. You go ahead." Jesus writes in the sand, and they all walked away. Quietly. There's something about the inner conviction inside of our hearts that we know inherently that there's something more that's needed from us. And so the moment is this moment, this issue, the key of the issue, the key issue here is this the sense of the understanding. Do they really grasp it? And Jesus takes an opportunity to build upon that by capturing this issue in verses 13, 14, 15, and 16. And he says it this way, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right for so I am. The word, the two words that I think are critical here is the word didaskalos. You probably need to make sure you say that four or five times. It would help you sleep at night. Didaskalos, that literally means teacher. 
31 times Jesus was referred to in Scripture as the teacher. He referred to himself this way eight different times. It was the word that was equivalent to the word rabbi. It was a common title for dignity conferred by students upon their teachers. You call me teacher, but you also call me Lord. It's the word kurios, not curious, but kurios. It's a word that expresses authority and lordship. It literally means to be owner. You know, we oftentimes, in our, in our conversations with the Lord today, we just say Jesus or dear Jesus or Heavenly Father. We have words sort of in terms of endearment, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we don't find any of that in Scripture. There's always high levels of dignity and respect that's spoken when they refer to Jesus. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. But if then, if I then am your Lord and teacher and have chosen to come in today and put on the towel and wash your feet, you need to wash one another's feet. There's an example he's given. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And here's the expectation, verse 16. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Jesus said, what I've done, you do. You know, if I were to look at that, and some, some denominations actually take foot washing to be an be a, uh, ordinance of the church. And I'm not saying that they're wrong. Scripture doesn't teach us that it's an ordinance of the church. But I believe what the intention of Jesus was much deeper than the physical act of washing feet. So therefore, verse 17, there needs to be a clarification of the issue, clarifying the issue, the challenge. Jesus says, if you know these things, don't miss this next word. Most of your translation says, blessed are you if you do them. Now, Here's where it brings me back to the Beatitudes. While the two have nothing to do, as a matter of fact, the Beatitudes really were very early in year two. Jesus pulled his disciples aside and said, guys, I want to make sure that you get where we're heading. I want to make sure you understand in order when we get there, I want you to know what's required of you. I'm calling you to follow me. I'm calling you to be my disciples. And if you're going to be my disciples, you're going to have to learn to empty yourself of you. That's point one. You're going to have to understand that that's how it all begins. And everything builds upon that. And if we, if we still struggle in that, and let me say three and a half years into the journey of following Christ, they're still struggling with point one. you're going to have to have a focus and that focus is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake and when you come to the place and you empty yourself of you and we have the proper focus we it builds and it builds and it builds to the point where that as we live our lives out before Christ and before this world we find ourselves blessed are those who are persecuted life gets tough Jesus said if you know these things just like the Beatitudes brings blessing blessing happens to those who do them I wonder today looking at this context of this story who was the most blessed person here it wasn't Peter. It wasn't Judas. It wasn't any of the disciples. The most blessed person in this story was Jesus. Because Jesus was doing what he was called to do. And I think at the end of the day, that's where we all struggle, is it not? We find ourselves in this journey of life being called to do things that maybe we're not yet willing to do. 
I, I think as we've walked in this journey of life, I think of myself even having been a follower of Christ for years and years and years and years. I still struggle with stepping on the throne of my own life. How do I know that? Because I still want things my way, right? And we all do. It's the greatest enemy we face. We look at him or her in the mirror every morning. But we have to go back to the beginning of the Beatitudes and understand this. Where it all starts. We've got to empty ourselves of us. Peter wouldn't learn that example that day. He wouldn't learn that example until it would be a day later, or actually a few days later, after the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, Peter would find himself having gone back to doing what Peter wanted to do, right? He went back to what? We know the story. He went back to fish. And after he'd been out on a night of fishing, having caught nothing, <laughs> Jesus called him to the seashore and said, Hey, listen, I've got a mess of fish for us to eat for breakfast. He didn't have a fishing rod. He didn't need one. He was God. And he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. You know I love you. And he said, do you? I know you told me just a couple of days ago that you'd go all the way with me to the cross. And when I look back, you were the first one that left. You see, Peter didn't learn the critical point of what it meant to be a disciple except through his own failure. Jesus said, do you love me? Peter said, oh, you know I do. The second time, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I do. Jesus said, do you really love me? And of God, we know the story. The third time, Peter says, you do. I, you know I do. And what did Jesus say to him? Feed my sheep. I've got a plan for you. But that plan will never be worked out in your life, nor will it be worked out in my life until I come to the place where I learn like Peter that discipleship is going to cost me something. As long as I'm looking out for number one, I'll never be the disciple God has called me to be. And the way I can check my spirit to see whether I'm number one is, do I ever get frustrated? <laughs> I still do. I'm working on that. God's working on that. But I'm learning something and I continue to learn in this long journey. I'm still learning. And we all need to. That it all starts back at point number one. I've loved a lot of the shirts we've made in our church, but this is my favorite one. And I share this with you today because while we one of our shirts, the most recent one, says that where friends become family, and we're, we work at that. It's, it's not, we're not perfect. We fail at that so many ways. But I think the real strength of our church lies in the fact of knowing that one of these days we need to understand that it's not about me. It's all about Him. Until I get to the place that I am willing to let go of it all, to be a disciple, sold out. I'll never be able to be the salt that God intends for me to be. Nor will I ever be able to be the light that He needs for me to be. So the invitation, I think, for us today, as it is to me, as well as it was to Peter and the rest of the disciples, is the Lord Jesus loves you. He's cleaned you up. He offers to you daily refreshment of His Spirit. The opportunity to be cleaned up every day. Are you willing to give it all and follow Him? That's the question. That's what our city needs. Is a church of individuals that's willing to say, It's not about me. It's all about Him. And I'm willing to do it all 
for the sake of the glory of my heavenly Father. Would you stand with us for prayer, please? Lord Jesus, we pause today to say thank you for the grace that you've given to us, the opportunity for us to be able to say, call you Lord and Savior. You've blessed us immeasurably. But today, in this moment, I pray that you might capture our hearts today as you did that day as you washed your disciples' feet. I pray that while no one today moving around in this moment, unless it's absolutely necessary, I pray that you would help us just now to look within. And there might be and likely are some things in our own life. There's had to be some, had to be some homework from me this past week that I had to take care of. And likely there's probably some things we've got to take care of in order to be able to set right some things that need to be set right. So I pray, oh God, today that you'd help us in this moment to understand the invitation to be your disciples is an ongoing one. And while we may start strong, we sometimes get off track. It happens to all of us. But I pray that you'd call us back as you did Peter so that we might be sold out for the Savior that ultimately the world might know that we are indeed the followers of Jesus Christ, that we may be salty enough to them that it would draw them, attract them to Jesus, and that the light of your truth might shine upon their lives, that they may be able to see the opportunity of your love and your grace and forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ. So bless us even as we ponder these words today in Jesus' name. Thank you.